so um, do shout or leave comments if there's anything that you want to ask. But basically just to say uh, a quick introduction to us, I'm Holly and um, this is Charlie and we're both now co-skippers of Clean Sailors. So uh, Clean Sailors started um, nearly two years ago, it'll be two years this summer, as a way of really talking to us um, sailors in the wider marine industry about um, our oceans and ocean conservation and why we should really care about them and importantly what impact we ourselves are having um, on our waters with our boats uh, but as importantly um, on land and at home. So we are just going to take 20 minutes or so to uh, run through a couple of things with you that we've found and a bit about our research um, and a, a couple of tips and things and some more about clean sailors as an introduction um, to who we are and what we um, stand for and we'll have questions and stuff at the end but if there's anything urgent obviously then um, I think you can raise a hand or leave a comment and, and we'll get to it. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Charlie to talk a little bit about us. Great, thanks Holly and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, just to reiterate, we're delighted to, to be partnering with you guys um, on hopefully a long and fruitful partnership where we can all share sort of best practice tips. As Holly mentioned, we're just going to start with just a quick intro about us. We obviously, we don't want to talk about us too much, but um, we hope you get a sense of, of what we're trying to do and and that actually the name that we are clean sailors actually represents everyone. And, you know, you don't have to just work for clean sailors to be a clean sailor. And that's kind of our ethos, really. Um, we're a very community based uh, organization. Um, so as Holly mentioned, it's been going for under two years, but it feels like it's been going a lot longer. We've done a lot. Um, me, myself, uh, I only joined uh, just after Christmas um, and obviously the company or the not-for-profit was set up by Holly just under two years ago. Um, our aim is, you know, to to research, to educate and help provide solutions uh, in the marine industry, in the sailing industry. Uh, I'll give a quick intro on, on, you know, our team, our crew, what we're trying to do, what we've done, how we do it, um, et cetera. And then I'll hand back over to Holly to, to get to the, the nitty gritty stuff of obviously the meat of what we're here today is to talk about plastics and obviously some time at the end for Q and A. Um, yeah, thanks. So we're clean sailors. Um, we put this slide in just to, to reiterate, um, you know, I won't go over again who we are, but we really wanted to emphasize that, you know, we, we're called clean sailors because we don't just see ourselves as the crew we have already, uh, which I'll go into a bit of detail in a second, but um, we really believe that, you know, eventually we don't need to be here, our organization. You know, we want to turn everyone into you know, clean sailors and everyone who uses the sea for whatever reason. Um, obviously our focus and your focus is, is sailing, is racing, is cruising um, in all forms of vessels. Um, and we all need our to do our bit to protect the seas that, that we call our playground. Um, you know, it covers 70% of our planet uh, and it's super, super important. Um, we are aiming, as I mentioned, we do our own research. We share other people's research. Um, we mobilize our community, we lobby. Um, and we really put a lot of ethos on trying to provide solutions. We don't just want to be, you know, a, a regurgitator of, of other people's knowledge. We are really striving to, to do our own research, come up with our own solutions. And they range from quite serious lobbying to uh, a recent thing we did. Um, a member of our crew um, did research, some research and came up with a solution for, for collecting antifreeze um, when you start your engine up after the long winter. And it's quite simply the use of, of string in a bucket, but actually it works really well. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, more information about that and other things we do on our website, which we'll, we'll focus on at the end. Um, so yeah, as I, as I briefly mentioned, uh, we're a pretty global crew, um, fairly diverse as well. Um, Holly set up the organization under two years ago, as we've mentioned, but we've, we've grown quite quickly, quite recently. Um, as I mentioned, me and myself have only been here about four or five months now, uh, really enjoying it. We're all volunteers. We all have other things that we, that we do, but we're all joined by sort of one passion and that's to to do what we can to to help protect our seas and and, and you know share and and educate all the research that we're doing so you can see here you I'm sure you'll recognize some famous names here um not myself and Holly <laughs> for, for the sailing professional but um you know we'll talk about our youth racing team in a little bit which are CJ Jan and Lucas uh, we recently welcomed Hannah Stoddle into our into our crew and, and Holly and myself are, are helping provide her support and awareness for her Vendee campaign, hopefully in 2024. Um, and we've got a whole host of other, of other folks who are scattered around the world who, you know, believe in what we're doing and we're all just here to, to help grow the community of, of clean sailors. Um, I've mentioned this already, but, you know, we, Holly started this and we've all joined to, to, to do this with her in, in for one core cool reason. Um, 
yes, we focus on sailing and yes, we focus on cleaning up the marine industry from boats to marinas to, to supplies to resources. But, you know, ultimately the ocean covers 70 percent of the planet. It's the biggest asset we have against climate change, um, which is just such an ongoing topic right now, as you all know. We won't go into that this evening, um, but it's just a, a little sort of symbol of, of why we think what we need to do is super important and why we need to, to work with as many people and organisations in our industry as we can um, to clean up the seas and keep them clean. Because, you know, not just to keep sailing cleaner, but, you know, it's such a big asset we have to, to combat all the changes that are going on in our planet. Um, this is something we include in our, all our presentations just to kind of step back a bit and, you know, not get too engrossed in all the nitty gritty stuff about the sailing bits, which is obviously what we love and we're all here to talk about. Um, but we are also here for, for a bigger picture and a bigger reason. Um, so, as I said, we, we, we've started with a purpose of setting new standards um, for, for the sailor, for the sailing industry. Um, we've done a number of research projects. I mentioned the anti fail one there. Um, Holly's not too long ago uh, did some sailing out in the Atlantic and the Azores to actually document our own research on microplastics. Um, and, you know, we're not claiming to be the leaders and scientific experts in all of this, but we really feel that there's a big opportunity and need to really drive forward a new standard of, of sailing. Um, I think we all think about it as sailors, you know, can we, can we use more water bottles instead of single use plastics in in longer trips, can we think more carefully about the sails we use and how we recycle them? And we'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the projects we do for that. Um, but there's a lot we can do, a lot we still need to do. Um, it's obviously great that we're here tonight talking about this, um, but we certainly started because we thought that new standards needed to be set and, and maintained and, and improved. Um, and we're not just here to, to send that message out from a, you know, a high tree, we really want to, to help provide solutions and tips and also learn from people who are doing other things differently. Um, and our vision, as we've mentioned, is to make everyone part of our community um, and to mobilize every sailor from any background, any age, any skill, any performance, whether it's the cruiser, it's the racer, um, it's the professional, it's the amateur. Um, we feel very passionate about covering all those areas um, to help protect our seas. Um, as I mentioned, I've mentioned a few of these. So we, we do, you know, we on our website that we'll, we'll share uh, towards the end of end of the presentation, you'll see a lot of tips that we've put together, a lot of resources, whether that's um, Netflix documentaries or books or um, videos or podcasts that we do ourselves, but also other ones that we recommend to get all these solutions and tips that, we, that we'll be talking about, and particularly on plastics uh, later on. Um, and I've talked a lot about why we were set up, what we're trying to do. Um, but we actually, you know, the practicalities of how we do that are through four key projects we have at the moment. Um, we've got a lot of others up our sleeve that hopefully we'll be announcing, you know, in the coming years. Um, the first one, obviously, is our umbrella brand, the Clean Sailors brand. So, you know, everything we do falls under that. And that's our main um, image that we want to put out to the industry. Uh, our Cleaner Marina initiative, which has um, started not too long after Clean Sailors. Um, is one where we're actually really trying to not just drive awareness and um, provide solutions and tips for cleaning up marinas and making them more sustainable, but actually lobbying and, and trying to set, you know, real specific new regulations on how marinas can be clean, how they can improve their standards. Um, we're going to be doing uh, quite a few questionnaires coming up, um, gathering a lot of our own research. Um, and we, we've got a growing number of partnerships with marinas around the world and we're looking to, to still increase those numbers. Uh, it's a project that uh, is a big one, um, but it's one that, you know, there really, there isn't too many real set standards in, in that field. So we think that's really important. Our Clean Sailors Youth Racing Team. Um, this is the fun bit that, that Holly and I get to work with. We work with three amazing um ridiculously overachieving people for their age, uh, which always puts myself and Holly to shame. Um, CJ, Jan and Lucas, they are doing the 69F Gold Cup at the moment. Um, and Holly and myself are sort of just helping behind the scenes, uh, get that campaign underway, underway um, you know, and, and, and ultimately help them win, win that competition. But the reason that we are with them and they're racing under our brand is because we're aware that, you know, we, we're not just covering big keelboat racing. We're not just covering cruising. Um, they're a good funnel into the sort of high performance scene and also the dinghy scene uh, where there's a lot of work we can do there. Um, we are passionate about covering all types of sailing and it's just a great way of us improving our brand and awareness. And then on the one on the right, 
resale. Um, excuse the pun. It, we thought it was quite clever in the name. Uh, that's a very recently launched project. Some of you might have seen that if you follow our newsletters and us on social. Um, this is an evolution of something we started a year ago um, in terms of recycling supplies in the sailing industry. Um, it's driven around sales, but it's much more than that. So it's basically a platform um, with an API in it that you can find drop-off points with partners that we've uh, connected with, and you can drop off old sales, broken sales, sales you don't use anymore. Um, and they can turn those into not just maybe improved sales, but a whole host of resources and supplies in a variety of other industries, such as construction, manufacturing. Um, and we're also using that platform to, to help provide um, new science, new research into actually how you deconstruct sales and the material science behind them so that those properties can be used for other sectors and other industries because a, a huge amount of sales still go into landfill and, and we need to change that as a community. So they're just four of our projects at the moment that are kind of at the front of our, our brand um, and where we do all our, you know, educating, sharing, providing through those, through those logos. Um, this is again, something else we like to include along with the, the picture of the globe. Um, we showed obviously the, the eight to 10 folks who are, you know, working quite heavily within our organization at the moment, but as I mentioned, and I just want to reiterate it again, um, you know, working with us or just, you know, sharing your tips and knowledge with us and, and listening to what we've got to say is, is ultimately the most important crew you'll ever join. Um, we won't be able to enjoy the sea or have fun in the sea like we will do on, on our sailing vessels if the sea continues to deteriorate. And this is such an important thing that we need to, to address. Um, and we all have the power to do our little bit um, to help make the seas more sustainable, to help sailing more sustainable and, and clean. Um, you know, a lot of people who don't maybe know sailing as well, and you'll know this just as well as me, um, probably see it as a clean sport by nature. You know, you're using the wind to, to power your velocity, but there's a lot of stuff that we all know is, isn't clean. Um, and we all have a responsibility to, to get together and, and help fix that. So come on board, um, ask us anything. Um, we're always here to answer questions and help provide anything we can. And we're also here to learn from people as well. So we see this as a big, big crew in a community. So um, yeah, as I will mention at the end, but any questions, um, that you have will be happy to ask uh, answer offline as well as online. Um, Thanks, Charlie. So we, we've actually had a question, if you want to oh, okay. ask them. Yeah. Um, so, so the question was, is the industry making any progress towards identifying, tracking and recovering freight containers lost overboard? Um, and is the industry yeah. making any progress with ensuring that freight containers are stowed securely and not lost overboard? After all, GPS trackers have been available for quite a while now. Mm, yeah, no, great question. Quite sweet. We've actually, I mean, they must have seen this presentation before we've shown it, because I think we're coming up with a, a slide or two about, you know, the impact we see from a day-to-day -day basis um, with, with freight containers um, compared to even the smallest microplastics. Um, are we able to take that question down and, and get back to you as soon as we can on that? Yeah, because I don't want to get misinformation here. We can um, I think there's also a massive spoiler in it because... We're actually doing some work at the moment and have been for a little while on exactly this topic, right? Because mm -hmm. certainly being based down in the southwest most of my time, um, shipping containers. Last year we got, or during COVID, we got tons and tons of nappies, like incontinence wear, washing off on um, the northern coast from exactly that. And you think 2020 was a year of lots of things, but it was actually the year of the most containers um, falling off freight ships ever, just in storms and otherwise. Um, and there's been some rudimentary... I say rudimentary, it's obviously quite a big challenge to solve, but there's been some work around trying to add trackers to every single container, um, which is obviously quite costly and ensuring that they stay waterproof and that they actually can be retrieved. I mean, you imagine the cost of, of trying to retrieve um, these huge things out of the ocean. So we are doing some work on this, but it's a very, very good question and one that is um, incredibly close to our hearts, not least because of where we live. Um, and you see some really crazy stuff. I mean, you get obviously there's cars that go down, there's rubber ducks uh, are still getting washed up in uh, north coast of Norway, etc. from a couple of spills a few years ago. I think actually 2006 was that spill and they're still sort of circulating these rubber ducks um, as well as things like toothbrushes. So great, great question. And it's definitely yeah. something that we're, we're working on. Yeah, great. And obviously hope you had hope to share some more of that soon. So we'll certainly note that down and, and, and put it in some future feedback. Uh, on the next slide, Hall. 
Great. Um, so obviously, you know, linked to that question, this is just, you know, before we go into a little bit more detail about plastics per se, um, you all know this, we all know this, we all see it in a variety of shapes and form, you know, the damage that not just sailing, but the marine industry is doing uh, to our community from freight containers, you know, that we might see crossing oceans or, or you know, even close to a shore to microplastics to, to land impacts. Um, this all falls into to what we're trying to, to improve and, and get better at. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's uh, having an awareness that it's not just looking at a boat and thinking, you know, fuel spill or dropping plastic into the ocean. It really does range from a huge variety of things. And, and that's what we're quite passionate about is covering all those angles and making sure we're all aware of, of everything we can do. Um, to contribute to, to cleaning up our seas. So just some examples here to, to get the brain thinking on, on you know, what to look out for, what to keep talking about, what to try and just share all the, all the knowledge that, that, that we're gathering up uh, as a community. Uh, next one, Holes. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, you know, it's not just the vessels. Uh, it's not just, sorry, you know, the freight containers and the plastics and, and the fuel, it's the boats themselves. Um, we'll show on a slide in a second, you know, there has been actual research done on the tracks of boats um, and the plastics that are left behind, the microplastics that are left behind um, from, from keels, from antifouls that are just as impactful as the vapor trails and airplanes. Um, so we have to also think about what we can do to improve our, our vessels that we're sailing in and that we're motoring in. And we've got a lot of tips that we can share on our website about that. And hopefully it might be something we cover in a future webinar as well, because I'm aware that this one is about plastics, which we'll get to very soon. Uh, and yeah, just obviously finally, again, just some more visuals on on constantly being aware of what we're doing when we're sailing. So, you know, top left, it's just a direct link to, to marine life interacting with boats. Uh, it's a very simple picture, but it, again, it's just triggering the mind that, you know, we might not be able to see microplastics uh, that we're doing research on. But even here, you know, we're disrupting marine life, we're disrupting habitats. And we're not saying to stop sailing. It's just constantly being aware of what we're doing. Top right, this is linked to our Clean and Marina initiative to some degree. Uh, we've all seen this, you know, the water in marinas. How can we get better at that? It's stuff that we're working on. It's research we're doing. And, and we hopefully, well, we will definitely be sharing more tips uh, and solutions in, in the near future, not just the bucket and string one that I mentioned with antifreeze, even though that works really well. Um, and again, you know, that picture of the bomb, it just, it, it, it is a signifies that we leave just as harmful tracks in the sea as we do in the, in the sky with airplanes, even though we can't directly see them. Um, next slide, Holes. Great. So I'm now going to hand over to Holly. I'm going to stop talking. Uh, I hope that gives you a little intro into Clean Sailors. What we're here to do, what we're trying to achieve. We're thrilled to be working with you guys and I'm looking forward to many more webinars. We won't be doing that intro maybe in, a, in as depth again and you won't have to listen to me ramble on about that because, you know, obviously this is the first one and we want to do an intro. Uh, but we're here to talk about plastics. So Holly, over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Stellar introduction. Um, so we chose plastics as our first kind of conversation because uh, I think it's one of the topics that's been become incredibly well known over the last couple of years in particular. Um, certainly, you know, not least because of PPE, I should say, uh, COVID and otherwise, but it's actually incredibly tangible. We've become incredibly, um, it's become very, very visible in a variety of different guises in our waters. And it's actually become so pervasive, not just our, in our environments, but also in our human bodies that we thought it warranted a conversation um, about what the issue is, how big it is, and actually maybe some of the things that we, um, as sailors, but also as beings on a planet can be doing about it. So I'm gonna rattle through a couple of slides just to give you a bit of a picture and a story around uh, what we found also as Charlie hinted at our own research that we undertook in the middle Atlantic uh, last summer, uh, cruising around the Azores, doing some um, trawling, et cetera, and analysis. And then also importantly, just what we can be thinking about quite differently, not just when it comes to our boats, but um, in everyday sort of life. So this was just to start um, on the clean sailors element and our team. So this was last August, I spent a month uh, with a couple of scientists from around Europe, uh, cruising around the Azores and trawling for microplastics. Now, microplastics are, we'll talk about it in detail in a minute, but microplastics are a certain size of microplastics that you can still see with the naked eye. So we probably were trawling for lots of different other plastics without even realizing it, but just by virtue of being able to analyze them quite easily with the equipment that we had, um, 
And also visually, this is the sort of size that we were picking up. And just for context, we would drop at least one trawl, which is what you can see in the top left picture, every 15 minutes for about 15 minutes. And we drop our speed down to around two or three knots uh, to make sure it just skimmed the surface water. And then we'd pull it up after 15 minutes and we'd wash it out and we'd see what was inside it. And every single trawl came up full of plastic. So you can imagine that this is literally just below the surface of the water, which isn't incredibly evident to us when we're sailing, but is incredibly prevalent. Um, this whole layer of plastic everywhere that we found. And the Azores are uniquely situated, right? For context, so in the middle, actually sandwiched between the North and the South Atlantic gyre. So you get this incredible circular motion um, of the ocean um, around, around these islands and obviously pulling in so much material from uh, North America in particular, swinging it around back to Europe. Um, and as the current goes on, it just drags it with it. So the beaches you often find are pretty covered in Oddly, things like uh, shotgun cartridges. Now, there is no shooting on the Azores. Excuse my puppy. Um, there is no shooting on the Azores. So these cartridges are actually coming from the north coast of America and also from Canada um, and getting washed across the Atlantic here. So you can see this is what our seas actually look like. And this is the middle of the Atlantic um, and not somewhere even like uh, the Mediterranean, which is actually even more polluted than, than that. And I just wanted to highlight that actually we're producing, despite us knowing the most about plastic now than we ever have done and knowing how um, prevalent it is and how polluting it is, we're actually producing more now than we ever have done in the history of ever. Now on the left-hand side, that obviously shows cumulative production, right? So this is just building on year on year since predominantly post-war uh, when plastic was uh, mass marketed. It's been an incredible substance. It is an incredible substance. It's malleable. Um, it's incredibly cheap to produce. And uh, often you can reuse it for a lot of different things. And often you can't. Um, but it's just to say that despite everything that we know, we're still producing more than we ever have done before. Um, and in 2019 in particular, we produced a record um, amount of plastic uh, globally than before. So it really isn't slowing down yet, despite our knowledge and despite efforts of lots of different organizations and otherwise. Naturally, there is an argument that it's linked to um, natural resource production and oil production, um, because obviously it's an industry that relies very heavily on, on oil, um, but that's for a different time after a couple of drinks. <laughs> but well, how are we using plastic? So actually the majority of plastic is used for packaging. And yes, that means you and I going down to a supermarket and buying things, but it actually a huge portion of this is actually uh, the logistical supply chain, right? So everything we buy has already been packaged and repackaged several different times um, from the point of its manufacture all the way to the shop floor or to our front door. And packaging really is um, the biggest contributor to our global plastic issue, opportunity, I should say. Um, you can see others there. So obviously this doesn't quite take into account the PPE issue and the COVID and, and the rise of that production there and how we're not being able to dispose of that particularly well. Uh, but packaging really is what we use it for, the biggest demand of plastic still today. And therefore it follows that actually the biggest waste generation or the biggest sector of waste generation in plastic is also packaging. And uh, this was back in 2015, but there's still millions and millions and millions of tons um, of plastic being wasted every year. And that's by virtue of it not being particularly recyclable uh, in many contexts um, or not having the facilities to recycle it or reuse it again, or actually just lack of knowledge and understanding as to the impact of it. And this, it sort of makes sense, but it's really important to deliberate on this point, is that despite all of this plastic existing in our oceans, 80% of all of it comes from our life on land. And that's us uh, littering. It's obviously a lot of um, pollution and otherwise being washed down rivers. Most of um, pollution that enters our oceans actually comes from the river water, uh, sort of waterways, which get washed down there. But there is about 20% of all ocean plastic, which actually comes from our activities on sea. And this is things like ghost nets, which you may have heard of. So these are fishing nets, which get um, dumped 
uh, often lost at sea by major trawlers and otherwise, uh, which obviously stay floating. But all of these nets now aren't made of natural um, fibers or hemp. They're made from plastic too. Again, versatility, strength, and affordability has kind of driven that. Holly, we've just had a, a quick question. Yes. Just really on that last subject. It says, how reliable is it that I take my plastic waste home after sailing and put it in my recycling bin for my local authority to deal with? It's a very, um, very good question. Um, yeah. I think this is one thing that um, you've jumped ahead to the very end, but I don't blame you. So I think one of the things that we're often told is to recycle, right? And recycle isn't necessarily a, um, a bad thing, but for context, recycling doesn't actually happen as, as often as we believe it does. So about 9% of all plastic gets recycled when we put it in a recycling bin. So most of it gets incinerated. Um, so there obviously is, is an opportunity to um, develop a very different system about recycling, but the best thing that we can actually do is try and not use particularly the single use plastic stuff in the first place, right? If we buy plastic things, ideally we ourselves would be reusing them um, because yes, we should uh, obviously take them off our boats and put them in a recycling center, but for context, they don't actually, we don't have that system sorted out yet globally anywhere in the world. Um, and the recycling kind of ecosystem is one which still has to be solved because so much plastic that we have produced is incredibly cheap, incredibly thin and often can't be recycled. Um, so it ends up unfortunately just getting burnt or also put into landfill. Um, so I'd love to say that's the solution, right? Because we've all been taught it for so many years by um, so many different authorities, you know, recycling is the answer. And it can be, it's just quite an imperfect system yet. And to think that 91% of stuff doesn't actually get recycled the way we believe it does means that we kind of have to think of another way around it. I hope that answers your question. So, I mean, my question would be, would it would it be best to then be buying things that you, that you can reuse, I suppose? Absolutely. Rather than recycle. That would yeah, be ideally. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because I think it's become, because, you know, certainly in the UK, and we are still quite ahead of most other geographies around the world, not at the front, but certainly ahead of most. The whole kind of single use ban, which came into effect a couple of years ago now, it kind of just makes sense, right? The fact that we'd be producing something which takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Um, I'm going to embarrassingly show you like a plastic pen. And I know there is someone on this call who would tell me off of this because they bought me one that's not plastic. But um, the, the point of the amount of energy that goes into producing something like this for it to be used once and then discarded is kind of mental. Um, so yes, as far as possible, it does make sense that we'd be producing things that are better, more durable, longer lasting, and that we can be reusing um, as often as possible. And plastic largely has the ability um, to provide that, right? It's incredibly long lasting. I mean, I showed you pictures of um, you know, ghost nets, for example, these take 600 years to break down and that's in the ocean. That's in a highly intensive salt water environment with a lot of attrition and a lot of action and a lot of UV light um, to help it along the way. It still takes around 600 years to really break down. Um, so it can be great stuff. So yes, reusing ideally um, is a lot better than recycling. Thank you. Okay. Great questions, keep them coming. Um, so we talked about packaging and how it is the most uh, prevalent form of plastic waste today. So once this plastic enters the environment, whether it's my rubbish Bic pen um, or a plastic bottle, it obviously gets exposed to a whole different variety of um, environmental forces. So UV in particular, and also waves, just wave action and the wind salt water also just works really hard on plastics over time to break them down into a variety of different size pieces. On the right hand side, I'm not going to get very technical. Far right, you can see the um, sort of mega plastics that literally is whole pieces of plastic products. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller over time to microplastics, which are still visible with the naked eye. Those are the kind of things that we were fishing out of the Atlantic last summer around the Azores all the way down to nan nanoplastics, which you can only really see um, under a microscope. But all plastic entering the ocean ends up getting um, just broken down, broken down over sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds of years, to the point where these plastic particles are very, very, very small. 
And we'll go on to this in a minute, but you can see on the left-hand side that there are sea creatures there. And naturally, they unfortunately end up uh, often mistaking these plastics for food or just absorbing them just by virtue of their size um, in the ocean. So again, just to cover microplastics, they don't just have to be little plastic fragments, but things like microfibers, um, another one you may have heard of, but these come from our clothes. A lot of our clothes are made from um, plastics, um, often recycled ocean plastic actually, and that obviously is all microfibers and that too breaks down. Plastic pellets, how we produce plastic, films and also sty styrofoam are all um, examples of plastics that you can find in our waters. Um, in fact, much of our environment. But just so you can visualize what microplastics look like, there's a lot of varieties. And I think this is quite an important and pertinent one, right? It's because the smaller these fragments get, the more pervasive they are in turn. So um, if you have one big plastic crate, the likelihood of it impacting a sea creature is, is likely, but it's probably only gonna be one. There's gonna have to be a really big one. Obviously, as we get further up the food chain, normally the larger um, the species. So the smaller the plastic particles, the greater propensity they have to filtrate down the whole food chain within our marine ecosystem. So you'll see at the bottom these really cute little critters. So we're starting at the sort of herbivore, early carnivore stage at the very bottom of this slide. They normally just eat organic matter and otherwise. But as you get further up, they start eating each other. And if they've got plastic in their systems, it ends up all the way to the top of the food chain to the major predators. Now, sperm whales aren't major sort of predators beyond um, zooplankton, but things like sharks, things like obviously human beings are the apex predators of, of technically of the ocean. So everything beneath us in the chain that's ingesting plastic ultimately ends up in us too, unfortunately. And I think, as we said, I mean, um, again, science has, has sort of taken leaps and bounds, certainly over the last five to 10 years, um, in understanding just how um, impactful plastic can be. And like anything, toxicity is often determined by how much of something you consume. If I consumed a tiny piece of plastic, I would probably be okay. But if I consumed a small piece of or a small drop of mercury, I probably wouldn't. So it all depends on dose and toxicity, right? But it's really clear that plastic is having a real impact on some of our marine creatures, not least because plastic is often coated in or contains a variety of chemicals. That's what plastic is made from, right? It goes through a lot of intensive processes to become plastic, um, but obviously, obviously gets things like colouring, a lot of textures added to it, a lot of different substances to make it useful for whatever purpose we need it. And what that means is, um, where, whatever that ends up in, or whatever species it ends up in, often leaches out um, over time into the, the living tissue. That also can include, um, although plastic looks really smooth, it's actually made up of quite a textured surface. So the longer plastic spends in an environment, the more it actually picks up a variety of other chemicals, viruses, bacteria, which also get transported. So sounds gross, I know, and a little bit difficult to stomach, but genuinely these are some of the things that have been found in marine species, notably in fish. Um, so you can see that their immune systems are being disrupted their ability to actually absorb the oxygen that keeps them alive is being disrupted. They're even having sex changes. So the impact of some of the um, plastic intake is disrupting uh, hormonal balances. And there have been instances where smaller um, sea creatures, like really tiny, um, tiny ones have actually changed to opposite sex um, as a result of this. Uh, and also obviously, the larger piece of plastic mean that then often sea creatures and particularly seabirds aren't then able to eat other things because their tummies are full, um, which is quite tragic to see. But obviously, if this is happening to the fish that we often eat, um, there is potential for this to have quite an impactful knock-on effect to, to the rest of us, um, certainly over time. And I think just to um, sort of sum up some of the more recent research, it has been incredible um, to see and obviously incredible because it's made it into the mainstream and it means that we actually know more and more people are understanding it. Um, but obviously quite incredible because it really is everywhere. And these are just a couple of the headlines that we've been um, working around in the last few years. 
um, is just where plastic has been found. We're talking about the depths of the ocean. So the deepest point on the planet, the Mariana Trench, um, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has got plastic in it. The Arctic sea ice has got layers and layers of microplastics in it. Um, Mount Everest ice has got microplastics in it. Um, and we've even found in some of our own research on microfibers. So that was the one I showed you, which is literally tiny little fibers, um, almost like you get stuck on your computer screen at times, you know, with the static. Um, they come off our clothes, uh, look like dust. They've been found in rain. I mean, it literally has been raining plastic. That study was done um, in the Rockies in, in Canada, which is quite incredible to see that it even is raining um, microfibers. So we know that it's everywhere in our environment, but it also is now um, pretty much everywhere in us. Um, so it's been found in 2021, the first study that came out um, officially to show that it had been found in the placenta of unborn um, humans. So in, um, in our bodies, sorry, dog like that. <laughs> um, also has recently, literally a month ago, been found in the deep, uh, deep in our lungs. Um, 11 out of 13 patients undergoing um, this particular type of surgery had microplastics deep in their lungs and also officially have been found in our human blood. So we, uh, we are aware obviously that microplastics are everywhere. Now the question may be, well, if they're in us, what impact are they actually having on us? And one of the scientists that I was sailing around the Azores with um, has tried to, is working on this exact study and it's very difficult because obviously we're human beings and actually being allowed to test on human beings is, is virtually impossible. But what he's actually been creating is a, exact replica of the human intestine system and also the lung system to see what kind of um, stress markers our cells are leaving to show that microplastics are having um, an effect. I am not going to go into detail on that because I am not smart enough <laughs> to relay that back to you but if anyone's interested we can share some links um, to his research because I think that's obviously quite an important part of us understanding plastic and why we should really care about it, right? Does it matter that it's in our oceans? Does it matter um, that it's in our bodies? Well, yes, it does. Um, but we're still getting to, to grips and just the beginning of our understanding about how that impacts our bodies. Does it cause things like cancer? Does it disrupt our immune systems? Does it affect our hormone, hormonal balance? Um, so the exciting thing is, because I know this can feel quite depressing, the exciting thing is, is that we know now more than we ever have done ever. Like the science is insane. There are some incredibly clever minds. And for the first time really in history, it is in the mainstream media um, pretty much constantly. So that's excellent news, right? It means us doing anything about it. Um, is a lot easier when those things come into play. And there's a lot of different actors in different parts of the industry working towards the same kind of thing. The slightly tricky thing is that it is really bad, <laughs> that unfortunately it has got as bad as this um, over the last, say, 50 plus years since plastic really came into sort of mass production, um, which is why it's really important where we can um, to do what we can in order to mitigate um, the impact, certainly on the sea. And as Charlie mentioned, you know, we're talking about 70% of our planet here is ocean. Um, it's the biggest surface area, the biggest ecosystem, um, and the biggest contributor to all things life um, that we have on earth. So making sure that we can do what we can as best we can, even as individuals, um, to help mitigate that getting any worse um, is really what we're here to talk about. So I just wanna summarize um, with a couple of quick slides, what we can do, because I know the problem um, feels massive, um, often to Charlie and me and the rest of the team, sometimes it feels really big, because it is really big, but actually each one of us can make a difference, and it may sound cliche, but changing the way that we do things, talking about it, sharing knowledge, um, and we've got some cool tips and resources to show you in a second, um, really does help, genuinely. So I think the first thing is literally quitting single-use plastic. It's not always entirely easy, but it is possible. And that can be everything from Holly, your crappy big pen, to your toothbrush, your plastic toothbrush, and obviously plastic water bottles, all of those things that you literally buy once and then chuck away after using, we've got to start doing without them, sincerely. Another thing, as we said at the very beginning, after a great question is, just reusing things where we can get plastic containers and stuff, just keep reusing them um, as long as it's safe and healthy to do so. 
I think there's obviously some of them break down over time. Plastic bottles in particular can get a bit weak, um, but reusing things as much as possible or for different uses. Um, there's always a need for a pot on a boat, I find, for screws and things. So it could be a butter pot one day and it could be a, a tub for something else the next. So just reusing things is, is obviously um, a really great thing to do. And I know it sounds really obvious, but remembering your reusables, whether it's going out to grab a coffee, um, shopping bags, making sure we don't use plastic unless you're obviously going to reuse them again and again and again. Um, and just making sure, again, that we limit any new plastic that we're taking into our lives. And importantly, and it may feel slightly controversial, but it's actually Think Fish. And we added this to the slide because, as we mentioned, 80% of all plastic in our oceans comes from our life on land, but 20% doesn't. And 20% is still a massive number. And a lot of the um, fishing material in our oceans is a result of the mass um, fishing mechanisms that we uh, have these days. So you'll see those, if you live on the South Coast or off the South Coast, you may be well aware of the super trawlers that uh, sort of scrape up as many fish as possible, uh, practically all the fish. Um, but it's really important that we do think differently about how we eat fish, right? We're never going to tell people how to how to eat um, or not eat, but it is really important if we are eating seafood in particular, that we shop local, um, that we shop small and try and get uh, line caught fish as far as possible. That also reduces the impact that we're having through our fishing nets, which genuinely is a huge, huge pollutant in our oceans, uh, not just a plastic, uh, but is the leading uh, killer of, of whales and dolphins worldwide. It's unfortunately not particularly pleasant. So just think fish, check where it's come from, make sure it's local as far as possible and try and get line caught um, if you can. Now for fun stuff, we have this uh, page on our website. I say page, it's a resource that we put together because we as a team have been watching and listening and reading so many cool things, not just about plastic, right? Because it's one part um, of an issue and it's, it's one part of our ocean. Um, but books, podcasts, films on sailing, the magic of the sea, uh, some of the best adventure stories that we've come across from um, you know, from Ellen MacArthur all the way to Joshua Slocum. And uh, we've on there just curated a few films that we've come across um, that we've really enjoyed and think that other sailors would love as well. And in this slide, we've just pulled out the ones that uh, we've seen and that aren't particularly pleasant, but are incredibly eye-opening um, into not just potion plastic, but actually the whole story of plastic and plastic production, which we found really interesting and is a great way to understand uh, from a slightly different angle, um, just what opportunity we have to do things differently. So these are four of the films that we have seen and would recommend. You can find them on our website. Um, just Google literally crew recommends clean sailors and, and you'll see the whole thing and a lot of cool books as well. Um, and then we also have uh, just some extra resources, just clean sailors resources. On the left, as I said, there's a lot of books and films and, and magazines and podcasts on our website that we've come across from a lot of different people and organizations um, across marine and ocean. We've also got our podcast. So we've um, started this last year and um, have been having conversations with some really cool people from scientists to inventors um, to um, conservationists, just in and around the industry to try and help us as a team understand things better, um, but obviously to help any sailor who's interested in, in the ocean um, understand things a little bit better. So do check out our podcast. It's on all the major platforms as you know, Shop, uh, Shopify, Spotify, Apple, um, etc. So take a listen and learn. So as Charlie mentioned, we do a lot of uh, research ourselves, a lot of writing um, alongside uh, the other resources that we provide, really trying to get to grips with um, some of the issues and opportunities, not just within marine, but facing our ocean. So screenshot there, things like anchoring, also um, recycling ocean plastics, some of the controversy around that, a bit about our own research. There's a lot of material on there. So um, do take a look, um, cleansailors.com. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. If there's things that you've come across or there's topics that you're really interested in learning about, we have the longest list, but um, it's really what excites us, right? And we're, we're learning all the time, all of us. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about what would be useful to you as well. 
And with that, I think we've gassed enough and I can see those questions. Um, we'd love to know what you would like to ask us. What are you interested in hearing more about? Um, what do you need? So we have a question uh, in the yes. questions. Um, so, so what is the drive um, to encourage the food industry to only use compostable packaging? That's a very good question. Compostable packaging is also quite controversial. And I think this is something that we began exploring actually last year with things like bioplastics. And um, compostable packaging is a little bit of a misnomer because most compostable packaging certainly today is only compostable in a, in a big composter. And I mean an industrial sized composter. It unfortunately isn't compostable in your back garden. And that is one for the advertising standards, completely appreciate it. But we are still actually quite far away from having genuinely compostable solutions. Um, there's a lot of marketing around things like bioplastics and composting. What it actually does, the way it's constructed, it still contains plastics. It's just constructed in a way that breaks down faster than say my crappy big pen. Um, and it does so in, an, in a more natural environment a lot quicker. So unfortunately it's still plastic and it is adding to the environment just like normal plastics would do. It's just doing it a lot quicker. Um, and unfortunately at the moment, a lot of it has been a little bit of marketing um, by a lot of companies. There's a really great article that we did on this by um, one of our old crew members, Libby. She is a microplastics uh, researcher and just finishing her PhD. And it's called Let's Ban Bioplastics. Um, and more than happy to share it or again, just Google it because it's one thing that just yet hasn't been entirely solved. Plastic is not a natural substance. So any compostable packaging, and unless it's literally made from leaves, banana leaves um, in their truest natural form, isn't compostable entirely um, the way that we believe it is. So it's one to watch out for. Um, and I think over time, obviously we're getting better. We're learning more. As I said, the science is, is incredible and there are a whole different host of um, materials and substances being looked at, whether it's seaweed or um, other forms of paper, um, which actually are as pure as pure can be in our in our modern sense. Um, so keep an eye out for that, but do look on our website. And as, as we mentioned, we're always looking for other solutions. And if you've got feedback or you found something that you think is really cool and you want us to look into, then, then just shout. Thank you. Um, uh, another question. So how can you be a clean sailor in a small island state, which has limited resources, like when you go on holiday? That's a very good question. Next question. <laughs> no, I think it's a really cool one. I think it's uh, actually one of the biggest, say, opportunities, right, within our global sailing community is because there's such a variation. I mean, in the UK, where most of us are sitting, um, we're doing okay. I say okay because we're, we're definitely not great and we've got a lot of work to do. Um, but we do have a lot of logistical infrastructure set up to help, not just in our marinas. And Charlie mentioned that one you know, a big part of being a clean sailor is having the um, resources in your marina. It's having a pump out facility or it's having recycling bins or even waste bins. Being in the Caribbean recently myself sailing, I had to walk about a mile out of the marina on the advice of the marina staff. Like the bin is that way, <laughs> just keep going until you hit the sea. Um, so it really does depend on having the facilities. I appreciate that. But small things like being able to shop local, um, making sure that where you can, you buy stuff without packaging, um, making sure that you are topping your tank up as you know, keeping all the fuel literally um, in the tank. And it sounds quite simple and quite obvious, but the impact of not doing so is so great. Uh, even if it's a couple of um, drops of fuel in the water, um, unfortunately has a, has a pretty nasty effect. Um, and also, I mean, Charlie mentioned it, one thing that we are working on is, is this sort of clean marina study, and we'd love to get feedback, the whole point is getting feedback from sailors, wherever you are, about what you're experiencing and what facilities there are or are not, because that helps us with clean marina, um, actually have those conversations really pointedly and um, with the best possible evidence with the wider industry and saying, look, um, you don't have these resources yet, how can we help you get them set up so it's not entirely easy I appreciate that 
um, but it can be more so in your choices about what you're buying um, and how you're running your boat. Um, so alternatives to plastic water bottles, it's something we've been talking about at, at the job committee quite a lot. What What's the best thing? Is it aluminium water bottles or just long life plastic ones? I mean, what do you think is best? It's a good question. I personally have Thank you. I personally have um, an aluminium one because it keeps my water nice and cold. Um, but I think different people have different um, preferences. I think the key thing is obviously cutting down on um, single use ones, uh, but often it comes down to, to personal preference. I think plastic ones are not bad, but naturally just plastic does degrade a bit over time in comparison to metal. So, um, it's yeah and it's you know aware that maybe not everyone wants an aluminium water bottle um or alternatives but if you're going down a plastic route it's to holly's point think about filtering plastic bottle so it will have a longer use so it's not obviously you know the core aim is in terms of actually avoiding any single use plastic but um if there aren't alternatives in your immediate vicinity then how can we think and encourage people to think of other forms of it so filtering is a is an option it lasts longer it's cleaner um, you know, we've all tried to use plastic water bottles for, for a long time. And then, you know, just by nature and consciousness, they we either lose and we forget them or they start to turn dirty and smelly. Um, so it's just having that mindset of maybe not trying to always achieve the ultimate solution, the ultimate clean solution, which is what we obviously want to get to. But in the meantime, it's thinking of other ways. And, and you know, for example, filtering plastic water bottles is something that could be an option as well. It's, yeah, quite, a, it's quite a heavily researched topic. And stuff we have looked into but even if you know we're not just proclaiming that we've got all the answers there's a lot of stuff just simply googling um, alternatives there and you'll get a whole host of of articles and research into other more eco-friendly versions of just pure single use plastic water bottles i have to say the only downside of having a metal one which mm. i've learned time and time again and still obviously don't learn because i'm still using it mm. is how how noisy they are when they roll around in the cockpit slash your bunk <laughs> when you're underway so just bear that in mind. You might want a little cover for your aluminium one if you get one. But also, I mean, when Charlie mentioned filtering, you also have, even on your boat, right, there's a lot of um, actually really good systems now where you can plug um, filters into your boat water um, system too. I appreciate it in parts of the world, and often when you're chartering a boat, it's more tempting to get sort of um, plastic water bottles. But if you do own your own boat or have influence over somebody else's boat, actually putting a filter into the into the um, water system is, is also another really good way of just clearing out the water, making it a lot more palatable. I think we've all had those cups of tea. I think yeah. just grew up having cups of tea with like scud on the top from the water tank. I don't know if anyone else gets that <laughs> on their boat still, but having water filters on, on board as well as, as another option. Um, yeah. I mean, one is fairly amusing one. that's probably not a viable option for every boat as now I remember, I think it was the 2019 London marathon. There was a company that that had introduced edible seaweed water boxes or water pouches uh, that had a longevity of about sort of four to six weeks which isn't long, don't get me wrong, but there is some pretty cool stuff going on in that in, in that sort of area of research um, that's actually quite interesting to read and just, you know, not knowing where it could get to. So, um, yeah, if anyone's got a dab hand of picking seaweed out of the sea and making a water pouch out of it, that is one option that might be a bit extreme, but the stuff is going on in those in those spaces. I've uh, got, got a challenging question. Is there anything more environmentally friendly we can use for an electrical tape on board? Oh, that is a good question, because it's one thing that, you see all over the boatyard, right? On the ground. Um, I have not yet come across the solution for that one because I appreciate how important it is and how useful it is. Um, but I think the key thing is just disposing of it as best possible. If anyone does know, like, please let us know because I'd love to hear um, a solution for electrical trait. I think the thing is, is that in most circumstances, right, plastic just is a really good answer because it's been... It's light, it's cheap, it's easy, it's malleable. Um, but I haven't yet found a good solution for electrical tape. I'm adding that to my list though, because that's a good one. <laughs> just just on the um on the food front. So what what would you recommend for food on board? So we had the, the, the question we had was, you know, do you do you know particularly good eco-friendly food, freeze-dried, you know, when you're offshore for like a couple of weeks, say. 
um you don't maybe like certainly my boat doesn't have a fridge or a freezer on board so it's there's pouches and jars etc what i mean what would you recommend in those circumstances yeah it's a great question and having just um been racing myself and having freeze-dried food we also haven't yet found a really great solution for um that right obviously the pouches are incredibly strong and heat resistant you add your water you have some something that tastes a bit like spaghetti carbonara for your supper um but again obviously it's waste so i think the key thing is you know where possible and uh often when you go into a marina or um a harbor the closest thing to you is sort of a normal supermarket but increasingly we are finding um pop-up stores and shops where you can buy refillable boxes and otherwise of, of of food so you can take a an empty container and fill it with pasta for example um and the same thing with jars and otherwise which is quite a useful thing um it's not to say i think charlie said like there isn't a perfect solution for everything right yet and we wouldn't be here if there was um but when we find an opportunity it's very much about you know talking to the suppliers there's a couple of suppliers of the sort of uh, offshore freeze-dried food that we're in conversations with at the moment to try and help find a solution or at least understand is there a reuse for them I, one thing that um some of my friends have been doing with the freeze-dried bags was actually filling with the soil and planting basil <laughs> on board as an example of just reusing them and giving things another life um so in terms of i think it's cutting out the packaging as far as possible where you actually um victualing uh, but appreciating there is going to be some waste unfortunately with food especially if you're going offshore great thank you uh next one um so just a comment uh from somebody who's listening to it the seaweed water pouch company is called notpla if anybody not flat yes yeah i have heard of that uh, and then uh a recommendation on alternatives to electrical tapers insignia tape because apparently it lasts much longer. Nice. Um, and then what should we do? So what happens to the sales that you recycle is one of the questions we've had. Great question. Mm -hmm. So we literally launched resale, um, as Charlie mentioned, in all of its glory last week after a pilot that we started in Falmouth in Cornwall um, March last year. At the moment, most of the sales are being used for... Um, or upcycled, I should say, into household and other sailing goods. So sailing bags, beach bags, beach cleaning bags, deck chairs, awnings, tent, um, tent kind of awnings. We've had various schools using them for outdoor forest projects. So you'll get um, them being hung up and kids camping under them for summer schools and stuff, um, which is really cool. But as Charlie mentioned, there's two other elements to this project. Uh, and one is actually working with the sail makers. We've got three major sail makers that we're um, speaking with at the moment around the actual construction of sails, because ideally we'd be making something that could be deconstructed quite easily and reused, um, but also trying to find an, another industry or other industries that could be using sails. It's great to have a sail bag made out of old sails, right? And we've got our own beach cleaning um, bags made out of old sails. But there's only so many deck chairs and bags that we all need, right, globally. And we've got a global platform. So we are working with a couple of different actors. And obviously can't say more at this stage because it's kind of all brand new. And we're trying to find a solution. But it doesn't have to be within sailing, right? It doesn't have to be within marine. Can we be using it in construction? Can we be using it in the automation um, industry? Um, it's the substance, a really strong, very hardy, well-made substance last for a long time even if it does get quite battered and bruised um so the key thing is is finding complete alternatives um anywhere um for it to be uh repurposed again and we're on that journey at the moment uh which is very exciting but not easy and actually one thing that we have found that i wasn't aware of um is just how flammable sales are and obviously there's that story about robin knox johnson just firing his flare at his sail but <laughs> he couldn't get it down and set it alight and burnt it <laughs> burnt it down instead but it's tr actually quite tricky is at the moment the way cells are constructed quite tricky to find something that's very safe indoor um to reuse them for um because of that flammability 
again, if anyone has an answer or needs a lot of sales from around the world for some really crazy cool new projects, then come to us. <laughs> we'll hook you up. Well, McGuff, uh, you raised your hand, so I've just allowed you to speak. I think you just need to unmute if you, have a, if you want to ask a question. Hi, Will. Hi, and I hit it by accident, so no, I don't have a question. <laughs> Oh, well. what, what a disappointment. <laughs> I'll, I'll mute you again, man. <laughs> um, another question. So uh, this is actually a combination of two questions. So um, would you consider uh, accredited marinas or charter companies or race committees um, who make a serious efforts to reduce plastic waste and, and contain pollution? And, and this is probably quite a broad one for you. Should rating authorities like RRC build sustainability into their ratings? Good one. So the first one, would we consider them in what context? In what sense? I, I suppose, um, I guess, approving, you know, if, if, a, if a charter company or marina is abided by some sort of sustainability code, would you consider accrediting them? Um, quite question. a broad question, just from the audience. Very good question. Um, I think there's there's a couple of things, right? So when setting up Clean Sailors, there was an, there's obviously an option that we could give people a rubber stamp and say, yes, you qualify to be a clean sailor. And we can do that. And the same with our marina project, it is possible. And there are others doing that candidly paid for model where you can pay for somebody to come and assess you and say that you're doing okay and come back in a couple of years time and tell you the same thing or not. Um, but for us, it's actually been quite important to, to be quite open and transparent in that anyone can be there's anyone can be a clean sailor and anyone can be a cleaner sort of marina and for us it's about having the commitment and um, making sure that we've got the guidance and um, the inspiration if you like for anyone who wants to kind of join us and we do that because we didn't believe it was a binary decision that either you qualified to be a clean sailor or you didn't I didn't know that, that, you know, insignia tape was a great example of something that I probably wouldn't have realized myself. And, you know, I'm not always a clean sailor, not, neither is Charlie. The point is, is that anyone can be one if you've got the right kind of impetus and interest in protecting our playground and our passion. Um, so we wanted to always keep it open ended that anyone can sort of join in, anyone can get inspired, anyone can get involved and just try and make a change. We didn't want to have a barrier to that entry. Um, however, we obviously do have bigger partnerships and bigger arrangements and as we're growing bigger sponsorships where we are, particularly on the marina side, um, asking for transparency and um, quality assurance in order to make sure that people are actually progressing. So in terms of marinas, it's making sure that, you know, they identify and we help them identify areas where they're not yet super so it may be that they don't have a pump out facility it may be that they don't have a particularly safe refueling station or berth um and also that they may still be applying or encouraging um you know sailors to apply paint-based anti-foul for example which really isn't very clean at all so um we work with rather than at a distance um so yes in terms of charter companies absolutely we've um have a few that we're in conversation with on that side it's obviously a major part of uh, the wider marine industry for sure the key thing though is really inspiring and educating um, all sailors and charters uh, in the same and we are finding that um, we're increasingly getting a lot of queries about how people can get um, involved with what we're doing but as I said we want to make it open for everyone you don't have to pay us um, we're not going to give you a rubber stamp it's rather hey this is what we're, our expectations are um you know we want this to be an open community and all strive for something better um going forward does that answer the question charlie do you want to add anything it's a tough one because i think you've, you've nailed it on the head there holly um you know do you compare other do you compare the sailing industry or the marine industry to other in industries and how they're accredited maybe um i guess it's stuff that, that we are thinking of but I think at the moment our organisation is certainly on, you know, inspiring and 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 lobbying and just sort of raising that awareness of what you can do um, individually. Um, the Clean Marina is a big initiative of ours and one that we hope will will have a big impact and who knows where it could go in terms of that accreditation. Um, but it's definitely something that we're thinking of. Um, not sure what else we can add right now though. <laughs>
But I think just on that quickly is that there's nothing to stop. And there's a couple of partners that we already have who, who also want an industry accreditation, right? And they do work with us to get themselves sorted. And, um, you know, we're much more about the sort of cultural and sustainable element of change rather than the kind of give me a certificate change um, at this stage. But people work with us and then they, for themselves and their organizations, they do want that accreditation as well. So they'll they'll get through a kind of cleaner marina process and then go off and get um, an official blue flag or otherwise to say that they are also um, accredited. So it's not, it's not a competition in that sense. It's very much like we're very much the facilitator in getting most um, sailors and also a lot of marinas from zero to something um, and then they themselves can go off from something to 100 if they want to later. Um, so two questions are basically about recommended products. Yes. So best type of loo roll, kitchen roll to use um, on boats, as well as toilet bleach. So it's quite a toilet focused question. Thanks, Bryn. And, um, Thanks, Bryn. <laughs> and what, what anti-foul would you recommend using? for racing particularly where we're all very interested in having a nice smooth hole yes a great question i'm gonna do the anti one first because it's fresh in my mind um so we've explored a variety of distant solutions right appreciating that obviously paint on anti is the most popular most traditional the most prevalent um we've actually found a couple of alternative solutions i think for racing um having recently just been racing on a, a volvo um, 70 myself, um, things like microglides, you'll obviously get a lot of silicon kind of or sticky back almost um, adhesive surfaces that you stick onto your hull, but they're almost imprinted with uh, almost like the surface of a golf ball is what they look and feel like. And they just, rather than obviously emitting any toxic chemicals the same way as anti foul paint does, they vibrate really gently, but very consistently. Um, meaning that nothing actually fixes to the surface. And if it does, then it can be wiped off very, very easily. Um, there are solutions like Finsulate, uh, which is almost like a, feels like felting when you apply it to your boat. Um, that is, I think that they have proven that they're sort of drag coefficient, meaning any kind of drag um, of your hull through the water is, is very, very limited. Um, and again, these things last for seven to 10 years and you have to apply it one time. And, and not even look at the bottom of your boat, right? So that in itself is a major win. Um, but look, we really appreciate that the traditional paint is the go-to. I know copper coat is incredibly popular, um, but they are, yes, they are toxic, whether it's because of their metal content, but more importantly, it's they're full of microplastics. And Charlie showed that image at the very beginning of vapor trail through, you know, an airplane vapor trail through the sky studies have shown in the North Sea that boats, our boats literally leave vapor trails in our waters. So um, I think some of the more high performance solutions like um, McGlide are probably the best for racing. And obviously if you're in your um, little boat and you're going like six knots like I might be, Charlie probably goes a bit faster, <laughs> um, then you can afford to have a solution a bit more like Finsulate, which at the moment is, um, still very race worthy but um you may be more comfortable with something like mcglide again happy we can summarize all of this for you um as well in the email so we'll give you links and stuff so you can go and find them and then the toilet i forgot about the toilet um the toilet is a good one i think there's a couple of uh solutions so obviously if you try um increasingly in main supermarkets you get um brands like eCover, which are obviously the best in terms of uh, mainstream, pretty accessible solutions. They obviously do loo cleaner and kitchen cleaner and anti back cleaner and all that kind of stuff um, for home as well as boats, right? We should be using the same everywhere. All drains, even at home, end up in the same place in the sea, full of chemicals. And um, also increasingly EcoWorks, who we work with very closely because their products are great. They use a lot of natural enzyme solutions um, in their cleaning products to break them down. And I've also recently tried out, um, we haven't sort of published it yet just on Clean Sailors, but you get these sort of toilet bombs, which are almost like uh, sort of powdery, they look like sort of pellets and you put them down um, a loo on a boat. And again, they're quite natural solutions, but they just sort of fizz. Um, and then more kind of um, bicarb based rather than chemical based. So that's another 
um, opportunity. And then the Lou roll question. I can't remember the name of the one that we... Um, so we actually had a recommendation, uh, Tanky Lou paper. Yes, exactly. And Tanky is obviously, again, who knew that toilet paper had plastic in it and the glue obviously between the sheets. So yes, Tanky is um, a really great solution because they are removing or have removed entirely the sort of uh, chemical glue that exists in toilet paper, which obviously lets the paper break down a lot quicker, doesn't bind it together, um, which is obviously quite useful for boat toilets, caravan toilets and aeroplane toilets. I believe they're testing it on or have tested it on as well. Um, so Tanky is, is another good one. Good shout to whoever recommended it. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, I was last two questions, Alexis. I think, because <laughs> um, we've done really well on time. Um, what what should we do with old ropes? Great question. So old ropes is something that actually we are just starting out also on our resale platform uh, because there are a couple of uh, projects who for a variety of different substances, um, substances different uh, uses. So very, very high level on a very early project that we're working with at the moment that will get listed soon is, is even making dog leads out of old sailing ropes and lines. In fact, I've got one for this dog on my lap <laughs> recently myself. Um, but it's again, it's it, much like sales. Um, we've created this platform because there are people, projects all over the world who need these kind of resources to, to do things with. And um, we found just a couple that we're getting started but this will become the platform and already is becoming the platform that you can list or at least find people who want your old sailing um, bits and pieces, sheets and lines included. Because uh, again, most of the, our sheets and lines are made of plastic. Even the eco-friendly ones that are coming out increasingly these days are all plastic based. Yeah. We've this had is a, a rec recommendation from uh, the guys about giving them to your local scout troop. Yes, them to, that's very cool. Yeah. And that, that just, that's, that's such a great, uh, you know, single example there. But you, there's a whole host of other community uh, providers, shops, services. You know, whether it's you know tree cutters, whatever it is, there are always going to be lots of local organisations in your own individual community that will need ropes, that will need sheets. Um, and as Holly mentioned, our resale platform is aimed at kind of that larger scale. Um, distribution of old resources and sailing but it's also you know I think we all have responsibilities ourselves there are local communities uh, that we live in ask around you know would someone local business find a use for sale for a rope um, I think you'd be quite surprised at how many people do would, would say yes um, so that's a very easy quick solution um, just sort of reiterating why I think it was Leslie who made that, that recommendation on the on the scouts so plenty of other ways that we could use ropes and, and perhaps the last question, is there a way of pressuring harbour authorities to only allow expansion, dredging, etc., if marinas have proper pump-out facilities? Yes, there is. We can encourage them to do whatever we like to. I think the key thing is, is, is actually, um, I'll put it this way. So the biggest thing for us with Cleaner Marina in particular is that we're dealing with businesses, right? So marinas, ports, harbour authorities are businesses. So anything that um, we're kind of asking them to do or recommending them, uh, recommending they do has to make economical sense based on, on what it is they're trying to achieve, right? They've got um, pretty slim margins. It's not a crazily uh, profitable business running these kind of things. There's high costs, um, high overheads, and obviously equipment costs and management um, maintenance costs. So Yes, there is. I think the key thing is, again, demonstrating use cases for um, where this has been done right. There's a couple of uh, conversations we've had recently around where dredging actually, you know, the dredging material has actually actually been laid then as banks um, alongside another part of the harbour and actually been used for planting um, things like seagrasses and otherwise in. So I think repurposing a lot of that um, has been quite an interesting example. I think the I think the case studies are incredibly important and that's exactly where we've come from and begun with Clean and Marina and will continue because every context is different. Every marina and harbour and port authority is different. But I think the key thing is there's a lot, there's a lot that can be done. I mean, we can, we can literally do anything. We have to demonstrate that it would make economical sense um, that someone else has done it often. It's, we're finding it a little trickier, obviously, to find people who want to be pioneering in any kind of space because it takes time. It can often be a risk, particularly if you're a business. Um, 
but yes, again, this project is very much around case studies. So if you've seen something or um, you feel as though there's a, an authority or a, a harbour that would be most interested in or well placed to, to help with something, then of course, like let us know and we'll be more than happy to, to help out with those conversations because I think it can be done um, for sure. And we make a lot of noise about people who are doing it and can demonstrate that things can be done differently. I do want to give a good example very quickly. Um, even if someone like, uh, we work with a big marina group here in the UK, and I will say them because they're great uh, boat folk. And we've had a few marinas saying, no, we can't fit out a pump out facility in our marina because we don't have the space. And boat folk put a couple of their marine engineers onto a project and said, find a solution for um, a pump out where you've got zero space in a marina. So the marine engineers turned this little rib into a pump out facility, which is obviously mobile now and goes around um, all the birth holders and say, you know, pay us ten pounds and we'll pump out your um, your heads and your bilge for um, you know the rest of the season. And we've had three other marina groups um, in Europe come and say, hey, that was really cool. We never even thought about doing that. So I think if you are seeing things which are really cool, let us know. Um, you know, we don't just write content; lots of people contribute to it. So. Um, tell us what you're finding, tell us what would be really useful, um, because the more that we can demonstrate that people have done it and that it's quite easy, um, the more likely we are to shift shift more people in doing so. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, final question uh, from Stuart, the job captain. Uh, when's the next Clean Sailors webinar? Oh, Stuart, what a nice question. You tell <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be in touch very soon about the next one. So. And also, I think, look, you've um, thanks all for joining us, right? It's been really cool to, to have this, and it's always great practice for Charlie and I to, um, to put this stuff together and remind ourselves, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. But, you know, we've got so many different topics and we work with so many different actors in the industry. So if there's things that you really want to hear about, then we can formulate these webinars around... Um, those kind of topics as well. Um, we've got a lot of research and a lot of a lot of things to share. And we'd, as I said, we'd love to hear your feedback on what's really useful to you or what do you feel is missing mm -hmm. in the industry um, or in the wider community. Just let us know. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much to Charlie and Holly, and thank you to everyone in Jog who's uh, who's been with us. And hope to all see you soon. Um, but please go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.